We're going to be in Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4 this morning. I'm not going to read all of, of these verses because um, i got a... This is a um, couple part message. And the second part of it, you're not going to hear until after Easter. Okay? The next couple of weeks I'm going to be dealing with death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I wanted to cover this before we hit that because you, you'll understand the nature of it. I kind of wanted to get this in, in what, uh, what I've been covering on Sunday morning. Uh, Luke chapter number 4. And uh, I just want to read a couple of verses here. And verse number 1, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days when he did eat nothing, when, he, when they were ended, he afterward hungered. About 35 years ago, when I was pastoring up in Greenbrier, Tennessee, um, Hollywood came out with a film back during that time called The Last Temptation of Christ. Some of you may remember that, that are about my age or older. Uh, but there was a great controversy at that time surrounding that film. And I don't know all the details because I didn't see the film. Wasn't gonna, they weren't going to get any of my money to go see it. But what I did is I read the reviews of it. And the reviews noted that the film suggested that Jesus had lustful thoughts about Mary Magdalene and may even had thoughts about bypassing the cross, which we're going to be talking about the cross and Christ going in, in uh, the, the weeks to come. Uh, typic, that was just typical Hollywood blasphemy and falsehoods regarding our Savior. Nothing of the sort happened. And I do remember there being a lot of discussion back during that time as to whether or not Jesus could have sinned. And in fact, I wrote an editorial piece to the local newspaper. We were in Robertson County, uh, Tennessee, and I wrote to them stating the biblical reasons why Jesus could not have sinned. Before we get into uh, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, I want you to understand uh, the nature of our Christ, and I want you to understand the nature of Christ's temptation here. And so uh, we're, we're going to take a look at this, uh, deal with the nature of Christ's temptation by Satan himself that occurred right after our Lord's baptism, just as he was beginning his earthly ministry. First of all this morning, let's understand the nature of man. Understand the nature of man. We know that man was created in the image of God. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he the young. That separates man from all of God's creation. No, no, none of God's other creation did He create in His image. Genesis 2 verse 7 says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man was created in the image of God, but man was also, understand, he was created in innocence. In innocence. He had not sinned, knew nothing about sin, Genesis 2.25 talks about Adam and Eve, and they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. And we know that man fell by transgression. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 16 to 17, talk about how God uh, commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And then in Genesis 3, verse 6 and 7, when the woman saw the tree that was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. She allowed Satan to, uh, to tempt her and get look, looking at the tree rather than listening to what God had said. And uh, she 
partook of the tree, and she gave to Adam. That's the, that's the key part there. When she gave to Adam, when Adam ate, that's how sin befell man. Because of Adam's sin, his sin nature passed to all men that were born after him in the flesh. We just recently in our Sunday evening services in the book of Romans dealt with this in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, understand that our propensity, or we could call it our inclination or tendency for sin, comes from the sin nature that has been passed down to us from Adam. We know the heart's deceitful, according to Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? That way that heart got deceitful is because of Adam's sin transferred to us. And because of mankind having been born with Adam's sin nature, mankind chooses to sin because it is his nature. Because we have a sin nature, we sin. We choose to sin. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And then in the New Testament, we know, we're familiar with Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a one of us that escapes that because we are in Adam, which separates us from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was not in Adam. That's why the virgin birth was necessary the uh, reason why we nail the virgin birth so, so much during the Christmas season and other times of the year is because it was necessary. Apart from the virgin birth, you would have uh, someone there born that could not be a Savior because he would have a sin nature like with us. And, and so uh, the nature of man is that he's a sinner by nature and he's a sinner by choice. Second thing I want us to see this morning, let's understand the nature of sin. Now we know the origin of sin. Sin entered into the universe by Satan. Uh, I'm not going to take time to turn there today, but Ezekiel 28 verses 11 through 19 and also Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 through 15 talk about the fall of Satan, both of those passages. In fact, uh, when you read those passages, you might get a little bit confused as he is addressing an earthly king. And, uh, but he's actually also addressing Satan behind the king, okay? And talking about Satan's, uh, Satan uh, is sin and how pride got into him and how he fell by sin. And so sin entered into the universe by Satan, but sin entered into the world by man. And we just shared those verses with you uh, just a minute ago. Now, understand the definition of sin. The word sin means to miss a mark or to overstep a forbidden line. To miss a mark or overstep a forbidden line. 1 John 3 verse 4 says, Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now that was true with Adam and Eve. They had one law. God gave them one. And they didn't, they didn't pay attention to that one law. They overstepped the bound. God said, you don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, and they did. And because they violated the law, they, they committed a transgression, they sinned, they missed God's mark. They overstepped the forbidden line. James 2 verse 10 says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. It only takes one, breaking one law to make you a law breaker. And every one of us that is in here this morning and everyone that has been born in the world with the exception of Jesus Christ have been law breakers. And we were law breakers because we chose to overstep a forbidden line. We, our, our parents, uh, uh, going back to Adam and Eve, they overstepped that line and because of the nature passed down to us, we choose to overstep the line ourselves. Now, we will turn to Matthew chapter number 5. And uh, I want us to take a look here for just a minute at the acts, the act of sin. And what we're about to look at here in Matthew chapter number 5, uh, we see that Jesus indicates that a sin described in Exodus 20 and verse 14 lies deeper than the overt act of sin. It's more than just committing the sin itself. 
It's the, it's the act of it within the heart. We see that, uh, look at, uh, first of all, let's look at Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18. Jesus said, Think not I, that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Uh, and so uh, the law was still in effect when the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ was here on the earth. And look at what he says down in verse 27 and 28 as he is talking uh, about uh, something in the law. He says in verse 27, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Again, that's Exodus 20 verse 14. He says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So the phrase there, everyone that looketh, characterizes the man whose glance is not checked by holy restraint and who forms an impure lust after a woman in his heart and mind. And Jesus is saying that's just as much adultery as someone who commits the actual act of adultery. Look at... Uh, Matthew chapter number 15. Matthew chapter number 15 for just a minute. And we see that it's what is within man uh, that is the problem. Matthew 15, verse number 18. Matthew 15, verse 18. For those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile of man, but he with unwatching hands defileth not a man. So he's talking about that the, the, understand the act of sin comes from a corrupt nature that men have inherited from Adam. It's not, it's not from being encased in this flesh. Okay, It's from the nature of the flesh that we got when we were born. Flesh has nothing to do with the actual sin. It's the nature of the flesh. We have Adam's, <laughs> Adam's flesh. And so I want you to understand that when Jesus came and he was in flesh, just because he was here in the flesh doesn't mean that he had the propensity to sin because he was, he was born of a virgin. And we know sin's consequences, don't we? Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and of course, Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15, talk about how that, that death that is spoken of there by Paul in Romans 6.23 is, is related to the, the second death. Uh, when mankind that does not know Christ will stand before God, before the great white throne judgment, and they will receive the, a sentence passed upon them to be thrown and cast there into a lake that burns with fire. How sad uh, that is. But, but God has provided a way, amen, for, for uh, all of us to be able to, to escape that. So we understand the nature of man. He's a sinner by nature, a sinner by choice. We understand the nature of sin. Sin is our transgression of God's law. It's our falling short of God's glory. And because of sin and sin's consequences, we need a Savior. We needed a Savior. And let's understand the nature of Christ. Christ was sent to be that that we needed. Okay? Amen. Understand the nature of Christ. Jesus Christ, make no mistake about it, if you, if you fail on this point, you fail to have a Savior. Jesus Christ is God. Yes. Amen. He's God in flesh. I want us to consider Christ's pre-existence. John the Baptist who was born six months uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ, said of Christ there in John 1, verse 15 and 30 both, he says uh, he was talking about one who was going to be coming after him, who was preferred before him because he was before him. Twice he said that Jesus was before him. Well, what was he talking about if he was born before the Lord Jesus? Well, he's talking about the Christ preexistence. The Apostle John talked about Christ's preexistence in John 1, verses 1 through 3, when he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And He tells us who that Word is down in John 1.14 as He says, And the Word was made flesh. Amen. And, and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John 1, uh, 1, 1 John 1 and verse 2 also, the Apostle John recorded, For the life was manifested, talking about Christ's life, God's life, that the life was manifested, we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Jesus, over and over again during His ministry, and those of you that were with us when we were going through the, book, uh, God, the Gospel of John, you saw over and over Jesus talked about having come from His Father, having come down from heaven. And in fact, uh, look at John chapter number 6. We'll, we'll take time to turn here. John's Gospel, chapter number 6. John 6, in verse number 38. <clears throat> John 6, verse 38. Jesus said here, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. Look down in verse number 51 there, in the same chapter. I, he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Any man eat of this bread, he shall, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Look at verse 61 and verse 62. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this, does this offend you? What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Okay? When Jesus came. He had been, he'd been with the Father. And, and we see down in, uh, look at uh, chapter number 8. Look at chapter number 8 and verse number 58. And this is when, this is when the Pharisees really got uh, uh, bent out of shape with Jesus and they were ready to kill Him right on the spot. In John chapter number 8 and verse number 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And then took they up stones to cast at Him but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. Why did they want to kill him? Because they thought he spoke about blasphemy, as, uh, talking about coming down from heaven, talking about being the I Am, that was referring to uh, 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 the, the pre-incarnate manifestation of the Lord there uh, with uh, uh, Moses in, uh, in the book of Exodus. But uh, we see also not only uh, the, the, the Christ Himself here talked about His uh, pre-existence, but um, the Apostle Paul talked about it as well in Colossians 1, 16, 17, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him, and He's before all things. By Him all things consist. So... Uh, you got John the Baptist, the Apostle John, the Apostle Paul, Christ Himself, all saying Christ's existence was before He came here to earth. When He when He was born, His physical existence in the body began, but His His eternal existence was with the Father there in heaven. So we consider Christ's preexistence. Let's consider Christ's deity. Colossians 1.19 says, For it pleased the Father that in Him, that is in Christ Jesus, should all fullness dwell. When you see the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the fullness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit right there. The fullness of the Godhead. In fact, Colossians 2.9 says, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What we know from that is that Jesus is no less God than God the Father. Jesus is no less God than God the Son. There's not three gods. There's one God manifested in three persons. One God. And Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. John 10, verse 33, the Jews answered him and saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Yes, Jesus became a man, but he didn't make himself God. He was God. And is God. So we see the nature of Christ. Jesus is God. But I want you to see the second part about the nature of Christ, and that is this Christ 
became man. John 1.14 says the Word was made flesh. 1 John 1 verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the Word of life. Talking about Christ coming into the world. Uh, that was prophesied in Isaiah 9, verse 6, where unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This child that would be born would be the very Mighty God, the very God in the flesh. Matthew 1 verse 18 says that when Mary was found with child, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 1 verse 20 says that which was conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And then we know that when uh, the angel appeared there with Mary in Luke 1 verse 31 through 35, talking about the enfleshment of our Lord, Christ was wrapped in flesh. Okay, He was going to be born, uh, but and not sinful flesh. And that was made possible by the virgin birth. Very clear that Mary says, I, how, how can this be, seeing I know not a man? Well, it was able to be that way because of Christ uh, uh, being born by a virgin birth. He, but understand that He was fully human. He ate. He slept. He hungered. He thirsted. He got tired. He wept. Um, Isaiah 53 in verse number 3, I'm not going to turn there, but it talks about Jesus, the suffering servant. And in that chapter, you will find He is called a man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. He was wounded. He was bruised. He was oppressed and afflicted. He died and was buried. All these things were prophesied by, by Isaiah there in Isaiah 53. And the Jews look at that and say, well, who is this even talking about? Well, they missed out on Jesus. They missed out that it's talking about Jesus. And all of that's about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the nature of Christ is He was and He is, understand, the God-man. The God-man. Let's understand also the nature of God. Now, we don't have time this morning to go through all of the nature of God. I want you to pick up on one thing, though. Okay, Just one aspect of the nature of God. I want us to look at this one aspect, and that is that God is holy. It's important regarding the person of Christ. Leviticus 19, verse 2 says, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. God is holy. Now, if you think, well, you know, that God makes mistakes or that God does things wrong, you're the one that's wrong. God makes no mistakes. He does no wrong because He is holy. Psalm 99 verse 9 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Now the reason I wanted to cover this one thing is because of this, how this relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we take a look at, at the, the understand that God is holy, we understand that Christ is holy. Christ did not sin. It's very important. That these things that we're going to be taking a look at the next couple of weeks with regard to the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior on our behalf, it's important that you understand Christ did not sin. And we're living in a time right now where, where people are changing their ideas about whether Christ sinned or not. I thought it was bad back 1988 when this first came when this film came out oh man we've, we've gone so far beyond that now and even people who profess to be Christians they profess to be born again are saying that they believe that Christ sinned how can you have a savior you can't have a savior if he if he sinned and uh, we know that the, the Bible says that Christ did not sin it says in 2 Corinthians 5 21 that he knew no sin listen to this passage for He, speaking of God, hath made Him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Listen, if Jesus had sin, we don't have righteousness. Because our righteousness is acquired from Jesus' righteousness. He knew no sin, 
uh, Peter said he did no sin. In 1 Peter 2.22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And the Apostle John says in 1 John 3, 5, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So you got two of the apostles affirming there was no sin in Christ. And listen, the apostles were with Christ on a day-in, day-out basis. They saw him uh, from the time of the beginning of his ministry all the way through to his uh, uh, ascension back up to heaven. And they, they would have known, had there been any, any sin with Christ, if anybody would have known, uh, I guarantee you, Peter and John would have known. The writer of Hebrews, who personally I think was Paul, they, he talks about how that Christ was without sin. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, talking about Jesus and his uh, in his capacity as our great high priest. It says, But it was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. Now, now understand that only Christ didn't you know Christ did not sin. Not only that uh, is true, but Christ could not have sinned. This is important. Christ could not have sinned. To suggest the capability or possibility of Christ sinning would disqualify Him as Savior. Because a Christ that is vulnerable to sin would mean we would have a God that is vulnerable to sin. That don't make sense. <laughs> it's, it's impossible for God to sin. Uh, we need to see that holiness is far more than the absence of sin. Holiness is also a positive virtue. What, would, uh, what some would say with regard to the temptation of Christ is that he could have sinned, but he did not sin. That's a wrong statement. To say that he could have sinned is to deny his positive holiness. To deny his positive holiness is to deny the holy character of God. The Bible is clear. James 1 verse 13 says, God cannot be tempted with evil. Jesus was not tempted with evil. I mean, there, yes, the temptation was there, but he never even, I mean, it, it never had a chance of getting through. Well, why was he, tempt, why was he tempted? We'll get, that, get to that in just a minute. But I want you to see holiness is a positive virtue which has neither room for nor interest in sin. And Jesus had no room for sin. He had no interest in sin. The Lord Jesus could not have sinned because the days of His flesh meant only an addition of an experience, not a variation in His character. His character is He is God. And His character never changed. From the time that He was existed in eternity past, till the time that He was once again back with His Heavenly Father as He ascended back to heaven. Nothing changed in through, throughout all of that that He could not have sinned. He, uh, he was uh, he, holy. Holy humanity was united to deity in one indivisible person, the impeccable Christ. Jesus is the only 200% man you will ever know. <laughs> 200%. 100% God, 100% man. He wasn't 50-50. He was fully God. And he was fully man, yet without sin. Amen. And the, why he was yet without sin is because he was not in Adam. And that, that's what makes the difference. He couldn't, could not understand that Jesus Christ cannot, cannot have more holiness because he's already perfectly holy. Okay, he's already perfectly holy. He could not have any less holiness because He is the unchanging Holy God. So the nature of Christ is He is the, the God-man and the nature of God is He is holy. Now, the last thing, we're going to draw this to a conclusion here. Let's understand the nature of Christ's temptation because we're going to come back and look at this in detail after the next two weeks, all right? It'll actually be after three weeks because I'm going on vacation at some point there. <laughs> After after Easter, and but uh, let's understand the nature of, of Christ's temptation here. Some would ask the question then: This they would say, if Christ could not have sinned, 
then what is it that we see here? What, what was the purpose of the temptation in the wilderness? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you. Okay? The answer lies in the fact that these trials were not to see if Christ would sin. That was not the nature. But rather to prove that He would not sin. There's a difference. Okay? It's not to, it's not to see if Christ would sin, but it was to prove that He would not sin. And we will see that when we come back and take a look at it and what, how it relates to us. So what do we do with Hebrews 4.15 then? Where it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That Well, that, that, that in all points tempted like we, we, as we are must be interpreted with that qualification. The qualification given by the Holy Ghost there is yet without sin. That means that Christ had no propensity to sin or possibility of sinning. Why? Because He was and is the God-man. He was and is God in the flesh. He was and is the Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us there in Matthew 1 and verse 23. Amen. Amen. Now you see why I gave you the handout, right? Okay. That's a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. Now I want us to review it real quick here, okay? The nature of man, we're all sinners by nature and sinners by choice. The nature of sin, sin is the transgression of God's law. It's falling short of God's glory missing the mark. And because of that, we need a Savior to rescue us from sin. The nature of Christ. He is the fullness of God who became man that He might become the one complete eternal sacrifice for every sinner who will by faith trust in His finished work of atonement on the cross of Calvary as the only way of salvation. The nature of God is He is holy. Because Christ is God, He is holy. The nature of Christ's temptation is to prove to us that He was and is who He, he uh, says that He is. And He is. He is God. Just like His resurrection is also proof. We're going to see that in a couple of weeks as we uh, on Easter will be dealing with the resurrection. The, the resurrection is a proof that, again, that He is God. So the question this morning is, have you received this God-man as your personal Lord and Savior? That's the question. If not, why not come to Him as your Savior today? If you have come to Him, are you living for Him? Okay? Because He, is he, he wants to be Lord of your life. Is He truly Lord of your life? Is He guiding your life? He wants to be. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ today. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You today for the truth of Scripture.